Only when I in bed on my own. Somebody who came in from outside of that community, they would have gone for those two surviving roommates. That would make more sense. Because if this person is a stranger, what difference does it make to them if they get one blonde girl okay. versus another? You know, they're not going to wait for six people oh, to be in the so house. Close. If there's two there by themselves, then that would be much easier. Right. And this still happened. We're mad. Um, we're really mad. We know that there is someone who is responsible for this. We know that there's someone who saw something um, and no one's talking. We're not getting any answers and we're not going to settle for that. Welcome back to my channel. Thank you all so much for joining me today. There is some news in the case of the four University of Idaho students. Kaylee Gonsalves, Madison Mogan, Ethan Chapin, and Zana Kernodal. The car, resembling this grainy image they're now investigating, captured on a gas station security camera taken around 3.45 a.m. the morning of the murders. Gas station employees telling ABC News they told investigators that the video shows the car speeding in the direction of the murder scene. But still, more than a month after the murders, officers asking the public for more help. If we get the word out there, Hey, maybe your neighbor has one in the garage that they don't drive very often. Maybe there's one that's just not on the registration database. Let us know. Now, this is an example of the vehicle that they are searching for. They are saying that it is a model from between 2011 to 2013, and that is pretty specific. They don't actually have a plate for the car. They don't say how many people are in the car, but it seems that this must be very important because they have been searching for this now for quite some time and they are specifically saying they believe the occupants have critical information. So what can that be? Do they think that this person actually saw something or heard something or do they think that this person was actually in the house? And now to this point, no one has come forward. This news has gone out nationwide and you've got to wonder how is it that this person who owns this vehicle, how is it that they haven't been able to either hear this news or just, you know, have a friend tell them about it? How is it that no one has come forward? I have noticed it seems like there's a bit of a change. In the last interview where I saw Kaylee's father, Steve Gonsalves, he has done an interview and he was saying that actually he does support the police and kind of backing up on some previous statements that he'd made. He said that he did not call them cowards. He said he'd had an interaction with one of the lawyers, one of the representatives, and that I he wanted to go out there and, to and tell person. everyone, we support, the Gonzalez family support the local police officers, we, so much so that we want them to be able to work on this case. I know that they, this is way over the normal workload that they normally have, plus they have patrols. They have to patrol now. This guy's not caught. So, um, you know, there were some rumors that I that I called these officers uh, a, a coward. That was not for these officers. That was for a lawyer that was standing in between what the lawyers, what the officers would like to release and what is actually being released. And I, I called that individual. And this was just about coming forward and saying that the profile is a male. You know, mm -hmm. I feel like at a month we could we can rule that that's not going to hurt the case. Um, that film. It, to the family, we've had that film for a while. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe the business reached out to us directly and um, after they had given it to the police. So it, it was kind of comfort to, to us because it's it's just two girls having a good time talking about, uh, you know, asking about their bartender and, and just just being just being girls on their way to uh, the grub truck. We did the obvious due diligence when we looked into that and uh, we've we were pretty, it was pretty clear that this individual was not a part of uh, the investigation as far as a suspect. They've, they've kind of informed us through uh, communications that this, uh, they've checked all the easiest paths. So like if this individual had this car registered to his name and it was just something very quick that they could just look up in the area and, and go right to his house, they've done all the, the due diligence there, they've done all that. So now they're reaching out and they're going to look to the community to see if uh, this individual borrowed this car. Um, 
you know, it doesn't appear that it, it, it's something that they have real easy access to. So he may have ran and they really pushed the narrative saying, hey, if we can get these guys to focus on something that's really helpful, which is this car and, um, you know, find out if somebody says, hey, you know, that 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 car that looks a lot like mine, I'm going to come forward and just volunteer my information. And then, you know, they can figure out if somebody else had borrowed it or if it heck, who knows? You know, Steve, we talked about this off air, um, but one of the reasons why I want to bring this up is because I think it's critical to this investigation. Uh, these, a lot of these young people were teenagers, and there may have been some illicit activity that was minor that they would have gotten in trouble for, and it may be preventing them from coming forward. What can you tell these young people to kind of motivate them to give up some answers. Don't worry about all the petty stuff. Four innocent lives were were lost here. Yeah, I, I want kids to understand that this is such a big uh, case that 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 these guys have their hands full. Um, and so I don't know, but it seems like there's a bit of a change in his words that he's choosing and that might be because he's either he has some information it could be that they're onto something that they're going to find this person very soon that they've been able to possibly give him some reassurance he does have his own lawyer now steve gonzalez's lawyer is there and he is also answering questions and he's doing media interviews and so i'm not sure why it is that they need that go-between between Kaylee's father and the investigators, he has that lawyer who is kind of a go-between, you know, for communication, for whatever, but they have taken a pivotal role in this case. We see a lot of them, they're talking a lot, but we don't see much from the other parents. At the very beginning, I did see that Ethan Chapin's parents did come out right away and they were talking and having a memorial for him, all of that stuff. We didn't see much from the other two a little bit yes we saw madison's boyfriend had a nice speech at the memorial he was there and he had a lot to say and that was actually um, very nice to see that he did that we have heard zana's mother come out and she mentioned that zana's father had fixed a lock he had been there about a week before to fix a lock and so i wonder if that has anything to do with maybe some serious uh, security concerns that Zana had, that possibly she had told her father about something, maybe some issues there at the house, that uh, maybe people had been going into her private space. That is kind of interesting to see, to find out from her mother, that it was only a week before that there were some repairs done. Maddie's parents, Ethan's parents, and Zana's parents have been otherwise pretty much quiet. Whereas we do see a lot from Kaylee's father, from Steve Gonsalves. He's out there a lot, um, you know, doing a lot of interviews. He did let out a lot of information. Of course, it did have to do with the coroner who told him some stuff. Now we're finding out more and more slowly. The place, it seems that they did have a lot of partying happening there. And there have been some videos that have come out showing that cops were called that they showed up at the house, knocked on the door, and were asking the guys about, you know, what are they doing there? Do they live there? Those guys were having a party. It was getting very loud, loud music. And when those cops go to the door, it's kind of strange because the guys say that they don't live there. And they say that the people that do own the place or that live there are not there, but also that they don't know who it is that owns the place. And if you ask me, I think it's pretty obvious that they were lying because those guys most likely do know who was living there and possibly they were trying to protect the girls um maybe they were drinking something like that could be that maybe some of them weren't there but still either way whether the girls were there or not it does seem kind of strange the way they were behaving but of course they didn't want to get into trouble and then we see in that same footage uh, we see that the cops are out there on the driveway and they've got the drinks in their hand and they're spilling stuff on the driveway. Anyway, so, you know, this, that footage kind of shows us that, yes, the home was um, used as a party house and they were having a lot of fun there, a lot of loud music. 
There were a lot of people at that house. There were complaints coming in to the police. And so, you know, that makes me think that, yes, there could have been a lot of people coming in and out. But, you know, you wouldn't have, let's say, a stranger coming in and out. I think it would be more so within that peer group. It would be people that they knew from the university, possibly friends that they had within the community. But I don't see those guys letting in some stranger just to go through the house. So it's kind of more so within a circle of friends. And so, for example, I know that that neighbor, Inan Harsh, he had said that he'd never actually been in the house, but that he did think about, he says at one point that he did think about maybe crashing a party. But of course, if he had been there, they would have noticed him. So the group of friends that did party there would have noticed if Inan or whoever had showed up. If somebody was there who was not within their circle of friends, then those guys would have noticed that. And so that's just a kind of an interesting uh, thing to think about, that regardless of whether they had people coming in and out, you know, still you've got friends in a house partying and they're going to be able to see if a complete stranger does come into the house unless somebody can get in and hide somehow. There has been some talk about whether this uh, perpetrator had come in before the girls got home, whether this person had broke in, but they didn't actually, there was no sign of forced entry. So I'm thinking this person was able to either get in from the front door or they simply got in from that sliding back door Oftentimes it was left unlocked. That was the first report that had come out that for people who didn't have the pin code for the front door, that everybody knew that you could just go around the back and that the sliding door was open and so that the lock was broken. And you see that the police have put a bench, I think a bench or two benches. There you can see through the glass. That is what that is. It's two benches. Those are there so that that door can't be opened. And so I'm thinking that the door lock was broken for some time. That is what I'd heard in the beginning. So this guy probably just went in from the back sliding door. But as far as when the guy arrived, does that make a difference? Does it make a difference if he was, let's say, hiding in the house? Is that important? You know, because if he, like, how is he going to hide in the house? Where? Because you've got the two girls who arrived at about one The first two, the survivors, they got there first. And now I'm hearing that one of the lower bedrooms was empty. And one of those two girls was actually on the same floor as Ethan and Zana, the back bedroom, which is beside the kitchen. And now that information has come up again. The question of whether or not those two girls were actually both downstairs. So more specifically, the bedroom below Ethan and Zana that one there uh, might have been empty. One of the survivors was in the bedroom beside the kitchen. And so that would make you wonder, no, she's going to hear more. You know, she would have heard if Ethan and Zana had come out and had had a fight, a confrontation in front of that bedroom on the same level, let's say out in front of the kitchen, then you'd think that that roommate would have heard something. You know, you kind of have to wonder, how is it that she didn't hear? And also, uh, going back to the to this perpetrator, if they were hiding inside the house, where are they going to hide? If they try to hide downstairs at the first level where we see the front door, then one of the roommates might hear them there. And then if they go to the level where the kitchen is, then the other roommate might have come out and seen them. And so I suppose they would have to hide upstairs. They would have had to sneak upstairs without those other two survivors seeing them, taking the chance that one of those two survivors might see them, might hear them, something like that. So I don't really see how that is. If it's, if it is the case that they did actually hide inside the house or if they waited, I'm thinking more likely that they, that this person was waiting outside and they, they could see when the lights are turned off either if they're hiding in the bushes there or if it is somebody who lives right there in the neighborhood then they could watch 
even more uh, securely. They could watch from within their own home and take less chance of anybody seeing them, let's say hiding in a bush or whatever, you know, having a dog bark, something like that. So this person could have been hiding in their own home and then they would see when the girl's bedroom lights are turned off and then at that point, that is when, when the coast is clear, when they see the lights are out, they can very quickly um, make their way into the house, knowing that people are probably sleeping, the house is dark, and it'll be safer. It'll be less risky at that time. You know, if they realize, if this person is watching, regardless of whether that is watching from a vehicle, watching from one of the houses, or watching, let's say, in the bushes, regardless of that, this person would have seen Ethan arrive and he would have been noticed to be much taller, you know, from a distance, even in the dark, they would see, hey, there's a guy here, Ethan and Zana are together. This person would be prepared uh, going into the house, knowing that, yes, there is one male in the house. But as far as hiding in the house, I would think that that is more risky because it would be more difficult to actually stay quiet in the house. And then you have to ask if this is a situation where this is a stranger, where it's not so much um, somebody within their circle of friends or let's say their circle of acquaintance within that community. If it's somebody who came in from outside of that community, then they would have gone for the first two. They would have gone for those two surviving roommates and that would make more sense because if this person is a stranger, what difference does it make to them if they get one blonde girl versus another? You know, because you've got two girls there already, the ones that survived. You know, if this guy's a stranger that came in from another state, you know, who's driving, who's just driving in, who planned this, let's say for a month, and they are there at the house, you know, they're not going to wait for six people to be in the house. If there's two there by themselves, then that would be much easier. So that does make a difference because those two survivors arrived first and they were there by themselves. So it was two people in the house, two girls in the house, and this perpetrator did not attack those two. You know, that would have been easier to get two versus entering the house when there is six people there and one man, one male. So that part really doesn't make sense, but it's kind of indicating to us that yes, they did want to get one of those four victims versus getting those two survivors. Now the police have come out and said that it's one weapon and that is pretty much from the beginning, but they don't have to tell us everything. Now they might be holding the cards very tight and they might have information which is different from what they're telling us, from what they're telling to the media they might have some piece of evidence which indicates that there might actually have been not one perpetrator, but two. You know, they might know that that car had the escape driver. They might have something which they're questioning, which indicates to them that this whole thing happened with more than one perpetrator. And of course, they don't want to let that out. They want to be able to zero in on these people, whoever they are, and to work in a way which you know, when you're playing poker, you're playing cards, you are not going to show your hand. You're not going to let your opponent, you're not going to let the guy sitting across from you know what you're holding in your hand because you want to win. And so you've got to keep that uh, secret. You've got to have your poker face on and that is the way that you're going to surprise your opponent. And so that is what this team of investigators is doing. They've got to be very careful not to let out all of the important facts. You know, some of the information that we have uh, might be telling a story one way, and then eventually, once they have apprehended the perpetrator, whether that's one or two or whatever, at that point in time, then they can let out maybe a little bit more information. They might come out and say that two men have been arrested in connection to this case. You know, they might come out and say that they have three people in custody in for questioning in connection to the Idaho case, something like that. And there might have been somebody in a vehicle outside waiting for their friends to exit from the house. And so that person becomes an accessory. That person would have seen the guy come out. 
an obvious state like a frenzy and of course that person has critical information for this case and so let me know what you all think about the case so far are you seeing this more so as the target being Kaylee is it possible that it was Madison you know Ethan or Xana it could have been any one of them let me know in the comments what you all think if you've heard anything else let me know does any of this make sense this is a very very serious crazy situation to see four innocent students become victims just meaningless totally meaningless so guys i look forward to reading your comments and i want to thank you so much for joining me today please take a moment and subscribe if you like this video please like and share and i hope to have you back next time bye for now yeah yeah my name is christy gonsalves k-r-i-s-t-i G-O-N-C-A-L-V-E-S. Oh, that was so Yeah, I'm Olivia cool. Stevenson, A-L-I-V-E-A-S-T-E-V-E-N-S-O-N. -E -E uh, Gonzalez is my maiden name, I'm married. My name is Tammy Butes, T-A-M-I-B-U-T-T-Z. Good, you guys good? Everybody good? Which one? You. Because I can't have to lie to you. Oh, there you go. Gotta get it right. Don't get mad. Uh, I think I think we got it on the the pickup. Good. Um, okay. So, just uh, first off, uh, the map that just came out from police mm -hmm. it gives a little bit of a timeline of where they may have been that night. Does that map mesh up with the timeline that you've been putting together? Yeah, I'd say it's very close. I'd say if you have any closer details to kind of hone in, one forty-five could be very vague. Maybe it's closer to you know one fifty. Let us know if you have anything concrete, because right now concrete's what we can go off of. In terms of the details, you said it's close. Mm -hmm. Does that frustrate you that, it, that it's close? I do, but right now we're still trusting authorities that, you know, it's not going to be 20 minutes here or 15 minutes here that's breaking this. Um, but yeah, I, I implore everyone, if they know something different, bring it to the police, because if they want to tighten up that timeline, um, we stand with that. It seems like there's this very big gap when it comes to Ethan and Zana. Do you know where they might have been? I don't, unfortunately. I, I, I know nothing about them. We, know, we, we have no idea where they um, were, but we do have a pretty tight timeline on Kaylee and Maddie, and um, it is close to what they are posting, but um, it is a difference, and that difference actually could be huge. I mean, it could be, it could not be. Um, but, you know, 145, 159... Um, so there is, and, and, and we have corroborated our, with my phone records, um, Kaylee's phone records, um, uh, the driver that was driving them around. Um, yeah, so you really have, concrete. you have pulled video seeing the mm -hmm. Uber driver dropping them off. Yes. You've checked your phone records. You know, yes. time stamps, mm -hmm. what yes. time they got home. Yeah. It's not, it's not exactly what police are saying, right? Right. It's not um, 145. Kaylee and Maddie were picked up from their home at 1122 King. Um, around 10.15. It's about a five-minute drive down. So they arrived to Corner Club around 10.20, which is different than what was released at 10. Um, we know that Kaylee called for an Uber at 1.45. He arrived at 1.49, got in the car around 1.50. It's about a five, six-minute drive. Um, they arrived home at 1.56. Is it frustrating that your... Is it frustrating that your timeline is based on timestamps from videos and phone records and their timeline doesn't exactly match yours? I just feel like there's a reason they're just putting it out the estimate. I don't know because they do have that information from that from us and they've asked us where we have gotten that information and we have concrete backing. Um, she put it together. Um, um, it could be conflicting stories. We just don't know. This is the information I, that I, I stand behind. I, I think that when they say 145, I think they're kind of uh, referring to the whole group arriving approximately 145. I believe that maybe Ethan and Zana, and I don't know, may have gotten home around that time. And, and then the girls obviously 159-ish is shortly after. So they're just kind of grouping that the, the group arrived home around 145-ish. Um, but they were not together. And we don't know anything about Ethan and Zana. We do know about Kaylee and Maddie. And, and some of the, the time stamping afterwards, you know, that 
you know, that your sister was making calls, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. She was making calls as late as almost two o'clock. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how do you know that? Um, so she was on my mom's cell plan. So we pulled my um, cell plan. on Sunday, I was able to pull those cell records. And you could see that she was mm -hmm. calling somebody out. Did, yeah. Does it seem like they, they may have been involved or does it seem like? No, no, not at all. Uh, Kaylee had no shame and, and kind of a uh, power calling. So it, it fits Kaylee. Yeah, no, yeah. And we know who she was calling and this person is, yeah. And, and this person was asleep, unfortunately, um, was not getting the calls. And um, it was, I don't know, a few calls between, for the for half an hour, she called him a couple times and, but no, um, it was not, we do not believe she was calling him for help. We were, we believe that she was just calling him to come over. If Kaylee was in, in, in imminent, uh, in danger, her or your Maddie, they would have called 911. They would not have been calling this person. Yeah. yeah. And that she was, was at, that was so at around 2. Yes. Yeah, so at that time we Started believe. around 2.30. Yeah. We believe that the girls were just fine. So, the, so, so from those phone records, it looks like the girls may have been alive around two thirty. Two thirty is what the last mm -hmm. call? Um, no, uh, the last call is shortly before three a.m. Short, yeah, that's right, two fifty something. Two fifty two. For yeah. both of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's now been five days. Right. And still, no killer. Still, no motive. Uh, how are you guys holding up? Yeah, I think it's different for everyone. Um, they obviously are, you know, the, the same people to us, but they were different to all of us. Um, to my mom, it was a daughter. To my aunt, they were nieces. To me, they were sisters. Um, and we all had different, you know, very complex and amazing relationships with both of them. So it's going to feel different. Um, Empty. Yeah, for all of us. Was just home. She just left on Friday. She left on Friday morning to go to a pie fi party. And she had just bought a brand new Range Rover. And she just... She contemplated all day long back and forth whether she should go home and because she just really wanted to show it to Maddie, mm -hmm. you know, and some other friends and whatnot. And she's just like, Mom, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to the Pi-Fi party and I'm going to, I got, Maddie's got to see this, my new ride. And I'm like, for sure. Like, I mean, it was nice. Right. It was really nice. She just bought it that day, all her own. And, um, and I talked to the girls on, um, I did, she, she had a fun time on Friday night, the, both of the girls, and then both of the girls texted me on Saturday. Um, so, so you were talking afternoon. to Saturday, yeah. Saturday afternoon? Yes, Saturday afternoon. They sent me pictures um, of themselves, oh. and um, Kaylee called me around 2.30ish on Saturday afternoon. And then I started, I was texting Kaylee just randomly on Sunday. Um, and right about those, when I look back at my times that I was, texting Kaylee, the police were swarming. So, so you, you were trying to, you were trying to get a hold of her on Sunday morning. Yeah. Just random, just Unreal. random talking. Yeah. yeah. Just, Hey, you know, what's going on? What did right. you guys do last night? You know, we, we talked a lot and she was supposed to be home on Tuesday. She said she'd be home on Tuesday. Uh, we, we were talking a little bit earlier, um, but whoever did this is, is still out there. Yes. Do you have a message for them? Turn yourself in. Stop. Stop all this. Let us mourn our children. And we can't when we know this person is out there. You know who did it. You, you know who you are. Just end it. The guilt has got to be just overwhelming. It's, it's got to no be hiding. sickening. Stop hiding. Stop running. Just turn yourself in. Just turn yourself in so we can move on. We can bury our girls. We can have a celebration of life for them. And... Continue to mourn and, and try the best to heal, start the healing process. But we can't with this person just running around out there. This person's dangerous. And we fear that this person will do this again. Now that he's done it once, or he can definitely do it again. We have no idea why. None. There's no reason why any anyone should have been targeted for any reason. These were young, beautiful children that were starting their lives. And they were successful and they were go-getters, and they were strong. There's absolutely no reason for jealousy or anything for someone to take for children's lives like this. Turn yourself in. You owe it to these mothers of these children, these fathers, these families. You're wrong. Turn yourself in. You, you said something that um, I've never even thought of, uh, which is, it's almost the worst nightmare, which is, is how do you bury your daughter knowing that they could possibly come? Yeah, be, yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's going to be, 
the, the services for these girls will be huge, you know, public. Mm -hmm. And to think that this person is sitting, you know, there at the church, just, I can't. You're, you're worried that the killer yeah. might show up to their services. Absolutely. Their candlelight vigils, you know, all of that. It makes me sick that this person could be there, standing right behind us, waving a little candle. You know, it's sickening, absolutely sickening. We're sick, we're just sick. We just wanted to end. It's a living nightmare. Yeah. It's a living nightmare. Now, in, in terms of uh, what police have been able to communicate to you, mm -hmm. have, have they been more forthcoming? Are they communicating with you enough? Um, I think it's an ongoing investigation. I think at the end of the day, I'm not an investigator. Mm -hmm. um, do I want more information? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, but we don't know if they have do it. Do I know that they have it or do I know that they can give it to me? No. no. So, of course, I'm frustrated. Um, but I can't necessarily point that finger direct. <laughs> Based on what you've seen so far, are you confident in their investigation? I have to be. Right now. I have to be. Um, We're counting on it. And I think that um, it's, it's easy to sit back and say, oh, I would have done this. Oh, I would have done that. But I don't know what they walked into. I don't know what they've done. Um, are there definitely some things that, you know, I've, I've heard that I, I wish I, I hadn't heard about the investigation so far? Absolutely. But right now, I can't. I am frustrated that I don't have more information. <laughs> But I don't know if they have information that they can give me. We don't know. We don't know. My husband is in contact with them every day. The FBI, Moscow, Idaho State Police. And every day he just says, nothing, babe. And I'm like, nothing? And he's like, nothing. I mean, just nothing. And I don't know if that's because they have nothing or because they're protecting the investigation. So, you know, it's hard to be mad at them if, you know, we just mm -hmm. know they're protecting the investigation. But it would be nice if they said we have something, you know, we have a little lead or we have an idea and it's, it it's, just gives you a little bit of hope, you yeah. know? And, and I mean, it we, is very hopeless mm -hmm. right now, I it guess, is. being left without that information. Yeah, cause you, you can't grieve, you can't mm -hmm. feel safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. Yeah. And, and if and Kaylee and Maddie were down there right now in this situation with somebody else, they would be home. Yeah. I would have told them, and they, you know, I would have been, you, you girls need to get home now, mm -hmm. like yesterday now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to families, I mean, I think it's Thanksgiving weekend or is coming up and, and most kids are coming home, but there's no way. And there's no way that I would send them back until this person is found. This person, it's an isolated, targeted, you know, incident until it's not. Mm -hmm. Until this person, this person was angry. This was not just, you know, Oh, he got drunk at a party and shot up a party, which I'm not putting anything down to, you know, people have lost loved ones that way. But this was a very violent, targeted attack. And hearing and hearing yesterday, hearing the coroner say that, that one person may have been killed in, in their sleep. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you had heard? Yeah. Um, yes. And that's hard, you know, but I guess for us, that kind of just indicates, you know, premeditation which we've been fighting since the beginning away from this term, you know, crime of passion. Crime of passion. Um, I think that that comes with a certain connotation that can lead to empathy, and so, we don't agree with that. No. So, so when you hear, so when you hear them say that someone was killed in their sleep, you think premeditation. Absolutely. I Absolutely. think it's impossible not to. And not one, four. I mean, exactly. I don't know if all four of them were. We don't really have the details, but regardless, four people were stabbed to death. And premeditation, I, I mean, like you said, it's you very went different than yeah. went into someone's house. house with a I'm knife. not saying, you know, weeks lead up. I'm not saying months right. lead up. You know, it literally could have been 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, but to somebody went in there. You know, this, this wasn't, this wasn't a kill. fight that, you know, the girls had said something and offhand this occurred. Uh, they, they must have, you know, walked in on vulnerable sleeping A coward. Kids. <laughs> it's um, a coward. Coward. And so for, for what it's worth, I want to run as far from the term of crime of passion mm -hmm. as possible because I think it's weak and I think it allows him to hide. 
Um, and I think it gives him an out that he doesn't deserve. That he walked in and got mad and angry. They were all there together and something occurred and he got mad and, you know, wielded his weapon or whatever. No, this person snuck somehow into the house, whether it was a door, an unlocked door or an unlocked window, but he was not invited and he came in with a weapon. Um, to do to intentional kill. harm. With intention, mm -hmm. with intention to kill. Intention to kill, exactly. Not and, even and, harm to kill. Yeah, and, and not just one, not two, not three, uh, four. four. One after another, after another, after another. And, and, and again, that, that little detail about the, the uh, it, it shows, like, there's vulnerability, right? There, there is the, the idea that there may have been defensive wounds, but at least one person didn't see it coming. Right. As far as we know. Mm -hmm. We yeah. don't know. Yeah. As far as we know. Yeah. Yeah. According to what the coroner has said. Right. In terms of um, somebody getting into the house, they, they mm -hmm. keep saying no sign of forced entry. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you think that this was somebody that was known to them? I think that that's kind of an impossible question. Yeah. I think it's a very popular yeah. house. As a mother, I feel like they know. I do. I've always felt that way. Nobody has told me that anyway. Just I just feel like, yeah. I mean, this is a college town. It's a small town. I feel that. I feel the girls knew this person. But we don't know that. Well, we don't. Yeah, we, don't we, don't, yeah, we, don't we absolutely that. don't know that. Don't know that. I that. just feel it in my heart that mm -hmm. that they knew the person, and I've always felt that way. I don't know why. I don't know why, but I've always said they knew him. They knew him. Mm -hmm. They knew him. I just don't feel like this was like some rando just driving through Moscow, happened to stop by their house. I will say um, they did have a keypad on their front door, uh, and it was a very popular house. So I, I know for a fact that people who weren't necessarily roommates of the house did have that code. So no sign of forced entry doesn't necessarily mean that they were invited in. That's all I can say. And, and the people that survived were on the first floor. Um, yeah, to our knowledge. To, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then if, if they come in through the keypad, is it possible to, to bypass a room on the first floor it and is. go up to the second mm -hmm. floor and third Correct. floor? Yes. Yes. There's also um, a, a door in the back that just leads directly to the middle floor. Mm -hmm. Got it. I, I don't want to put you guys through any more. Um, I think we're, we're good. Mm -hmm. um, one of our uh, senior producers did have one question. We know it's been tough getting answers from police for everybody. Just what have police... Um, told you guys about um, about the investigation, what they found, what's going on, and God will. Yeah, yeah, I, I think to answer that question, um, we know exactly what the public knows. We really don't have any further details. Um, and unfortunately, if we did, I wouldn't give them to you guys. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just we frankly, we're not ready for that. I would never impede the God. We don't. Yeah. We don't. Mm -hmm. The public needs to know is that there is someone out there that has violently killed four people, and that no matter who died first or second or last, they're gone, and we need to get this person now before it's too late for anybody else to suffer what we are suffering for yeah. for the rest of our lives. Please. He took their lives, but he took them from us. That will never change. We will never let Kaylee and Maddie's memory ever disappear, but that's all we have left, and that's not enough. Period. Done. Mm -hmm. There's your answer. Yeah. There is no other information. There is no other information to get. And unfortunately, you guys will probably hear it first anyway. Yeah, right. We do. Yeah. It's pretty true. Things leak out there all the time. And we're like, did you see this? Did you see this? Did you see this? And yeah. we're like, nope. So I, I called my husband. He's like, I haven't heard that. for, you know, the reporters and stuff that have reached out to me ahead of breaking these stories. Yeah. Um, you know, even if it's only 20-minute heads up, it's nice to be able to process that information as a before. family first before reading it online. Blast it out so, there. Yeah. To everyone who has done that, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, you know, I know that if it bleeds, it leads. I get this industry. I'm not stupid. Um, but thank you to those who have done so respectfully yeah, um, and with agree. empathy in their hearts. Agreed. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thanks. And we'll do, we'll do the same. Uh, I mean, Of course. No, thank uh, you. Continue to mourn and, and try the best to heal. Start the heal.